Despite abilities appearing since the first Splatoon game, there are a few unlucky abilities that have not returned. You know the drill. Hey there, I'm Evie, a longtime Splatoon player, and this is the fourth video in the history of Splatoon abilities. Though, this time, we're taking a little bit of a different approach. Instead of talking about one ability, we'll be talking about all the abilities that were exclusive to Splatoon on the Wii U. The structure will be a little different, as well as we'll go over all the balance changes as usual and talk to see if there was a point in time the ability was used, and if it left a legacy despite being trapped in the first game. Well, let's get started. Damage Up is a stackable ability that's pretty straightforward. It increases the damage for your main, sub, and special weapon. Since this is our first time going over stackable abilities in the series, each of the brands of a gear piece is more or less likely to roll a certain ability when leveled up. Damage Up is 5 times more likely to appear on gear with Squid Force, and 5 times less likely to appear on gears with Incline. Damage Up has always been prominent throughout the life of Splatoon 1, though its in-depth workings are a little bit more complex. Damage Up will not reduce the amount of hits you need to kill, and will cap out the damage at certain variables. For example, splash o is a 4-shot kill, doing 28 damage. No matter how much you stack, it will always be a 4-shot kill, and cap at 33.3 damage. Though, for chargers, rollers, and blasters, they all work very differently. For chargers, damage up increases damage for all levels of charge, meaning you'll be able to kill someone from full health without having to do a full charge. So for chargers like E-Leader 3k, having the most range and the slowest charge time in the game, you can mitigate the weaknesses somewhat by reducing the amount of time you need to charge to get a kill. Of course, full charges still have their place, as painting a further distance is helpful and you can only pierce with a full charge, meaning to hit through multiple opponents. Though, with Bamboozler, you can never do 100 damage, just 99.9, .9, which means if the enemy steps in an ink for single frame, it's over for them. Chargers, damage up is amazing, and it should be considered on basically all of them. For Rollers, you'll still always kill with a Crush, except Carbon Roller, which will never regardless the amount of damage up, but it will increase your one-shot kill hitbox. This is very impactful, as Rollers hitboxes can sometimes be inconsistent with variable damage, so giving them a wider margin of error is good, as not securing a kill quickly can be the end of you. This helps for a weapon like Dynamo Roller, as the wide and far-reaching one-shot hitbox was made even bigger with damage stacking. Rollers got changed in version 2.2.0 to only kill on the center of the hitbox, along with not killing with no ink. So damage up accelerated the ridiculousness Rollers had before then, but it's still a very good option now to make them remain consistent. Lastly, Blasters. Now, damage up increases the damage for our direct blast, but it doesn't make the wrecks of Rapid Blaster or Rapid Blaster Pro one-shot, capping at 99.9. .9. But, it also increases the damage of the splash radius, and for Blaster, Range Blaster, and Luna Blaster, their indirect radiuses were able to do 125 damage. The main weakness of Blasters is just gone. Aim in their general direction, and they're just dead. Along with Luna Blaster having a bigger blast radius back then, if you had less range, or slower, or you got the jump on someone, you would just lose. There was almost no counterplay. You could maybe panic special with Kraken or Bubbler, but you'd need insane reaction time, and latency can get in the way of it. You'd see Luna Blasters everywhere, and this was meta for a while. It was extremely chaotic. Though, in version 2.2.0 on October 21st, 2015, damage up when applied to Blaster, Range Blaster, and Luna Blaster got nerfed making the maximum amount of damage from an indirect blast from damage up 80 instead of 125. This was a huge nerf. Basically, no one runs damage up on these weapons anymore, as the stacking is horrible. It took around two mains back then to reach over 100 damage, and now two mains only gives you an increase of 8 damage. Wow. A well overdue nerf. And after this, Splatoon 1 started to transition into its quick respawn and stealth jump meta, with Luna Blaster still being the pioneer of it, as many of the weapons back then hadn't become horrible, just the damage up wasn't ruining it anymore. Damage up also helps subs close the gap for chip damage on stuff like burst bombs, though it's not really useful in specials, since most of them are one-hit kills and the extra damage is only really big for objects. I suggest you check the Incopedia page for damage up, linked in the description, as it goes into the formulas and limitations of the abilities, something that's too specific for this general history video. That's how damage up was left in Splatoon 1. Well, not getting any direct changes to the ability, how it interacted with certain weapon classes has changed. 
Damage up is still good today, and very helpful on chargers and rollers, and it helps on low damage weapons like Aero Spray, Splash Nomadic, or weapons that are close to a benchmark, kinda like Splattershot Pro, Jet Squelcher, Range Blaster. Damage up is gone, and honestly, I want it to never return. It throws the balance of some weapons completely off, and it's hard to account with certain interactions. In Splatoon 2, they introduced main power up a little while later, which has a large portion of their weapons include damage up, and even though the stacking was harsher in Splatoon 2, people don't remember it fondly, and it's good to keep this ability in the past. Defense up is a stackable ability parallel to damage up, which increases your defense against main, sub, and special weapons. Defense up is favored by incline, which means it has a 5 times more likely chance to roll, and unfavored by crack on, 5 times less likely. Unlike Damage Up, Defense Up can actually ruin some weapons that are close to hitting thresholds. Specifically, 52 Gal, as the main turns from a 2-shot to a 3-shot. Different amount of Defense Up can negate certain amount of weapons, but remember, if there's a weapon that likes to use Damage Up consistently, you'd have to run a lot of Defense Up to counter them. Though, Defense Up also reduces the amount of damage taken from Fall Off, so it can help even more against those weapons at range, such as Dual Squelcher. But like damage up, there's some limitations. Anything that can kill you in one shot still does. Bombs, fully charged charger shots, roller crushes, inkzuka shots, etc. Though, decreasing splash damage from bombs and messing up the amount needed to charge for damage up on chargers like E-Leader is pretty nice. Defense up never really was meta in Splatoon 1, as other abilities were usually worth running. Though, weapons that might like it are short-ranged, aggressive weapons that are always fighting. Reducing multiple sources of damage, even by a tiny amount, can help you survive. Though, Defense Up lived on somewhat in Splatoon 2, being turned into Bomb Defense, then Bomb Defense Up DX. Then, in Splatoon 3, Sub Resistance. I prefer this way of balancing. It doesn't mess with the main weapons too much, and it still gives you flexibility on how you want to approach your up-close encounters. Though, this is where Defense Up stands in Splatoon 1. Special Duration Up is a stackable ability that increases the amount of time your special is active. Special Duration Up is favored by Forge and unfavored by Takaroka. It's a very straightforward ability, increasing your active time of Bubbler, Inksuka, Kraken, Bomb Rush, and Echo Locator. While for Ink Strike and Killer Whale, it gives you more time to aim your special, but not how long the attack is active. For specials like Kraken and Echo Locator, it's great for longer duration, as it continues to suppress your opponents for longer and keeps up the pressure. But for Ink Zuka and Bomb Rush, there are certain benchmarks to get an extra Ink Zuka shot or bomb. Two subs, five subs, and so on. Well, for the former two, it's fine to put any amount that feels right. Initially, Bubbler wasn't seen too much with it, as the returns weren't great, but your teammates who got the bubble would also get the increased special duration. Though the extra aiming time for Ink Strike and Killer Whale was almost useless, it didn't stack well, and even if it did, it wouldn't have changed anything, as you usually know where to fire the special beforehand, and getting stuck aiming for longer makes you more vulnerable, so it's an active hindrance. But in version 2.6.0 on March 8th, 2016, Special Duration Up got two changes. It first increased the maximum amount of time for Ink Zuka and Bomb Rush, going from an extra 40% to 60%, and shortened the end lag after launching an Ink Strike or Killer Whale. Though the former doesn't change much in smaller amounts, the more special duration up you'd have, the more value you'd get. And the latter still didn't change much. The end lag isn't too bad, and reducing it shouldn't be a non-issue. You shouldn't be in a vulnerable position when launching the specials, so it really just helps you get back to the action faster. Not by much, though. Though only a few months later, in version 2.9.0, on July 6, 2016, Special Duration Up got another change, increasing the maximum duration for Bubbler and Kraken from 40% to 60%. This was done in the same patch that Kraken and Bubbler got their duration nerfed, so if you want to get back to their old duration, you need to sacrifice a bit of your gear, which I think is a good trade-off considering the strength of the invincibility specials in Splatoon. Special Duration Up was never a prominent ability. If any weapon ran it, it'd usually be Kraken and Echo Locator ones, like both E-Leaders, Kraken Splat Roller, 96 Scout Echo. It's a very simple ability. Nothing too exciting, but it gets the job done. It returned in Splatoon 2 a special power-up, enhancing the effects of your special, making it more useful for every special rather than applying an effect that might not work within the name of the ability. But that's how Special Duration is left in Splatoon 1. 
Bomb Range Up is a stackable ability that increases the throwing distance and velocity of bombs. It's the only stackable ability in the entire Splatoon series that does not have an associated brand, so it has an equal chance on all gear pieces. Out of the 10 subs in Splatoon, it only works on 5 of them, while having zero effects on the other 5. Not even something small like Special Duration Up on Ink Strike or Killer Whale. It's just straight up useless. You literally get nothing. But even on the subs it does work on, you don't see it too much. I'd say the subs it works on the best are Disruptor and Splat Bomb. Having further range Disruptor allows you to catch up with enemies who are trying to run away, or be able to get away yourself if they're fast approaching. With Splat Bombs, giving them extra range on your lethal bomb can really throw some players off. It helps shorter range weapons trap or pressure players from long distances previously unreachable. Though, on Moray Towers, all bombs that are affected by bomb range up have been able to throw subs further on the enemy's snipe from far away. It's pretty nice. It makes the map a little more bearable for short range weapons, gives them a nice approach option. The bomb range up isn't really an ability you ever see. Not only it's difficult to get gear that has subs of it, since it isn't favored by any brands, but the weapons that benefit from it usually don't want it all the time, and there's only certain maps like Moray Towers or Hammerhead Bridge. In Splatoon 2, it was reworked into sub power up, enhancing your sub weapon, which is good because that meant the ability was able to work on more than just half the subs. But with no balance changes ever, there was a very uninteresting history of bomb range up. Alright, now we're getting into some weird abilities. Recon is a shirt exclusive ability where you're able to see the positions of the enemy on the Wii U gamepad while standing on spawn. Sorry for the scuffed footage, I don't have a Wii U gamepad capture card. This ability does not feel good to use. Having to look away from the TV to track where the enemies are is very disorienting, but even if you know where they are, the second you leave spawn, they're gone. You might not be able to deduce their general area, but more likely than not, by the time you swim or super jump in there, they're probably gone. Literally no weapon benefits from this. But in version 2.6.0 on March 8th, 2016, Recon got two changes. The tracking of enemies on the gamepad was increased for 3.5 seconds after leaving spawn, and now the gamepad will show what weapons each user has. I mean, cool I guess, but it still doesn't fix the main problem. Knowing what weapon is where is nice to know, if there's a fast killing weapon right outside your spawn, but the 3.5 seconds extra after leaving spawn means I still have to look at the gamepad, which more times than not, will most likely get me killed since I'm not able to see what's happening on my screen directly. I'm grasping at straws here, but I have the most minuscule niche for this ability. If you have an ink strike or killer rail, you can jump back to spawn and know exactly where to place the special and try to be as effective as it with possible. In combination with quick super jump, you'd be able to super jump back to teammate or squid beacon in order to catch them off guard. But I'd argue this niche isn't even really good. First, it requires you to super jump back to spawn every time you use your special, which wastes more time than just hiding behind a wall to launch it. Also, when the special is launched, it's telegraphed, so they can just move out of the way. Just because you sent an ink strike to someone doesn't mean you're guaranteed to kill them. And you need a lot of quick super jump in order for this to work effectively, as the super jump ability wasn't buffed until Splatoon 2. I'd argue, if you need this much setup for it to be useful some of the time, it isn't useful at all. But that's how Recon was left off in Splatoon 1. Almost no one used it before and after the buff, basically no weapon benefits from it. There are many abilities, subs, and specials that affect player location that come after this, though none explicitly tell you their weapon as of now. A uniquely bad ability that will probably never be remembered. Alright, the final ability we have today. Bomb Sniffer is a shoe exclusive ability that reveals the location of bombs to players using it. The main use of Bomb Sniffer is detecting where ink mines are placed, so you're able to cover over them and make them explode prematurely. It also helps with bombs out of sight, such as the suction bomb hiding behind a wall. Bomb Sniffer works on splat bombs, suction bombs, burst bombs, seekers, and ink mines. Though, on paper, it sounds nice to know the location of ink mines, ink mines were the worst sub in Splatoon 1, as their detonation time was a lot slower, only one was allowed to be placed, and already automatically exploded after 10 seconds. Once in a blue moon, an ink mine will catch you off guard, though ink mines were not on any relevant weapons, so they were almost never seen. While knowing the location of sneaky splat bombs and suction bombs can be nice, they're pretty loud if you're listening out for them, and usually reactable. Also, the bomb sniffer detection radius isn't that far, about the range of a splattershot pro. 
I understand not showing every bomb on the map all at once, but this feels a little too short ranged. But in version 2.6.0 on March 8th, 2016, Bombsniffer got an interesting buff. It would reduce the first 100 points of damage by 40% against spot bombs, suction bombs, seekers, ink mines, and 20% against burst bombs, while also ignoring damage up and defense up from both players. This means the bombs will do less damage to you, but if you're still within the lethal radius, it will kill you. Though, the second part is a little weird. After some testing, damage up and defense up still affect bombs from Bomb Sniffer. For example, with no damage up or defense up from either opponent, a direct burst bomb goes from 60 damage to 48 damage, and an indirect goes from 35 to 28, allowing you to survive an extra one each. Though, I thought the text, damage values do not include the effects of damage or defense up, meant that those abilities wouldn't be taken into account, but I guess I was wrong. Only damage up or defense up that stack in high amounts aren't affected, such as splat bomb that does over 200 damage. Very complex wording. Bomb Sniffer is mostly used for the secondary effect, that of taking less damage from bombs, though it's very outclassed. While it does reduce damage by a higher margin for one main, it doesn't reduce damage from all sources, but its main problem is opportunity cost. Being a shoe exclusive ability, it directly competes with Stealth Jump and Ink Resistance Up, which most weapons would not want to give up. Bomb Sniffer would be good on weapons that are aggressive and take damage in fights. Splushomatic, Lunum Blaster, and Carbon Roller are some of the weapons that can benefit from this. Though, not as much from other abilities, like Stealth Jump, Quick Respawn. Bomb Sniffer was never really used in Splatoon, even after the buff, as giving up Stealth Jump was not something you wanted to do at the fast paced meta at the end of Splatoon 1. Bomb Sniffer is one of those abilities that gets no use, no one remembers, and is a joke in the community. I think one thing all these abilities have in common with each other is that they're very clunky, like damage up working differently on chargers or not being balanced around blasters, or the effects given aren't that compelling, usually overshadowed by something else, like how the main use of bomb sniffer wasn't even added until almost a year after launch. Special duration up and bomb range up got reworked to be more general and able to work on more things, defense up and bomb sniffer somewhat merged in order to be resilient against bombs, Damage up didn't initially return in Splatoon 2, but it later did for many weapons' as main power-up, while Recon never got to see the light of day again. I think Splatoon 1 abilities are really cool to look back on. It was the devs' first try at many things, and it was interesting to see where they succeeded and where they failed, and what they tried to fix on certain things. Though, hopefully we won't get anything as clunky as some of these abilities in the future. I want to say thank you for watching. This is a little bit of a different take on the history of Splatoon abilities, and I want to do one for the Splatoon 2 abilities at one point. Though, that will probably be later down the line, as I have a feeling it'd be even longer than this one. I just put up a community post where you can vote on the next ability you want to see in the series, so go vote on your favorite. I want to say thank you for watching, and make sure to subscribe to keep up with all the Splatoon content coming in the future. Bye.